Okay, here we go. Let me ask my question again. Bill, you've just come from experiencing the Nazi bell and whatever else was up there. Uh, you can take two on that, because I wasn't experiencing the Nazi bell. I went to take a look at the hench. Okay. So, so start again. <laughs> okay. You don't know what you're doing, right? <laughs> you have no idea what's going on. Go on. No, that's what's not true. On? Stop okay. it. Okay. Okay. I, maybe I don't like it. Okay. So... Um, you just came back from experiencing the Henge and the surrounding area. What can you tell me? What, yeah. were, it, was it spooky? It was a visual experience because the thing was larger than I had ever imagined it to be. Because on the internet you see these little, these little tiny pictures taken with a wide-angle lens when it wasn't nearly so overgrown. And when you're underneath this thing, this is a huge, huge thing. It's supported on these, on these, big, on these big pillars that are far larger than a man. And the whole thing is a very dramatic object indeed, right in the middle of these woods. It took us a long time to get there because the snow is about a foot thick and there are a lot of fallen trees and branches and things. You've got to bushwhack your way through it. And uh, you never know... But in the picture, know... it looks like it's out in the middle of an uh, open area with cement. Those pictures were taken a very long time ago. I see. And now it's, it's become overgrown? It's completely overgrown. You'd never find this thing oh. unless you knew exactly where to look. Okay. So they used but, prisoners, though, up there. Isn't oh yeah, that true? This is forced labor. The Nazis used yeah. forced labor in many of their factories. And this is how come they were able to establish such an efficient industrial machine. Um, because they were working in a totalitarian environment under conditions of huge brutality. And um, if there's any, if there's any uh, residue of bad feeling in these areas it can be easily understood because a lot of people suffered hugely in those places uh, in ways that I don't think we can imagine these days. Why people come to a place like this is because we all have a fascination for our own unknown history. This is why Americans come to Europe. This is why we go to visit ancient castles. This is why you went to Egypt. It's to answer questions that we, we may not even have properly formulated, but there's a sense of the unknown in our own minds. And it's like an itch that you have to scratch, however dark it may be. And so there's this kind of grim fascination with, 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 with what is it that we're all jointly responsible for in our society, in our civilization? What is it that, you know, that we're trying to, to whitewash over these days? And maybe there are clues here to, to, to how savage mankind can be and it may be very valuable for us to be reminded of that even in this day and age where life feels so comfortable where life feels so easy where things feel so safe maybe that's an illusion maybe it's appropriate for us to remind ourselves about you know how man's inhumanity to man is always there like a dormant volcano so this is bill ryan for on project camelot and it's the 15th of october 2009 and I'll repeat the month again, it's October, it's not December, so Robert Felix from Ice Age Now would be quite interested in the, the strange anomalous weather that we've been experiencing here. This is pretty unusual stuff. We've got quite a few inches of snow, maybe even up to a foot in places. And what you can see behind me here, over my left shoulder, is this object that has become a sort of an iconic representation for all that is not yet fully understood about the Nazi technology, the advanced technology, that there is a lot of evidence that is gradually being accumulated by Igor Witkowski and others that during the Second World War the Nazis were experimenting with things that even now, 60 years later, we might not fully understand in the public domain. And uh, a little later on in this video you'll be seeing us talking with Igor in detail about the evidence that he's amassed to suggest very strongly to many other researchers that the Nazis were doing something very, very strange and that this project here, which has become known as the Nazi Bell, may well have been the most top secret of all their top secret projects. And we've just been battling our way through the woods in the snow, as you have seen. And the first thing that struck me is that this structure here is enormous. I've seen photographs of it on the internet, as many of you watching this video will have done also. And uh, I had not been prepared for something that was quite this large. We'll be talking with Igor later about what this was. It bears some strong resemblance to water towers, 
but Igor has done a lot of research in this area and we don't actually know for sure what it was used for. It's not the only piece of evidence at all which suggests the reality of these experiments that the Nazis were doing. It's interesting and it's visible and as you can see here it's pretty dramatic but actually the core, the solid core of the evidence that suggests the reality of what the Nazis were doing actually lies elsewhere. They shut these people in the mountain and they killed them with a chemical weapon uh, before they closed the, the mountain door so that they couldn't escape even if they were able to crawl through the tunnels or something of that nature. Um, so it's, uh, it's really quite, quite a dark scenario. The whole area feels dark. I mean, it's felt, it felt dark since, since we arrived. I don't think it's my imagination that the dark, the deeper you go in, the darker it feels. I don't actually know if it comes out any better in this. Of course, we can't read Polish, but apparently they put up a plaque in 1994. Um, so it, it's not all that uh, long ago. Okay, so this is Bill Ryan with Kerry Cassidy, and this is the 15th of October 2009, and we are. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Start again and say Project Camelot. Bill Ryan and Kerry Cassidy from Project Camelot. Okay, did I not say that? No, you didn't. Okay, all right. Go ahead. Start again. This is Bill Ryan here with Kerry Cassidy from Project Camelot, and it's the 15th of October 2009. And we've just come in from traipsing around in the deep snow, to my amazement, on the 15th of October. We shouldn't be having weather like this, but for some reason we do. And it's my personal delight, and ours I think, to be with Igor Witkowski, who is a Polish researcher. He speaks excellent English, and he's written a very wonderful book, the English title of which would be The Truth About the Wunderwaffe. And of course that's a reference to the Luftwaffe, which is the German Air Force. And he is a, a military historian and a researcher, and a little bit of a modern archaeologist, I would say, because what we've just been doing this morning is looking at some ruins and relics of some very interesting structures in the woods that may or may not have something to do with the fabled Nazi bell, as it's become known. And in this interview, I'm going to talk with Igor about his research, his interest in this topic, the conclusions that he's drawn, some of the other things that he would like to tell us about, which we don't have the opportunity to visit or check out in person. And Igor, welcome. My pleasure. And uh, for the benefit of the people who are not familiar with your work, can you give a little introduction to yourself? How come you came to be interested in this topic? And you're a pioneer, to some degree, of studying the possibility, in, in your view, I believe, the strong possibility of advanced Nazi technology that most people do not recognize ever existed. When you first came across the bell, was that in written documentation or was that in witness testimony? And was it called the bell? The German, I think, is called Die Glocke. Yes, the Germans called it Die Glocke. The initial uh, information was uh, uh, interrogation protocols of two Germans involved in the evacuation of the, of the bell. And uh, there was no explanation what this device could be. It was known but the bell, but uh, it referred actually to the external appearance because it, it resembled a, a bell to a large extent, uh, being around uh, 10 feet high, 3 meters, and uh, one and a half up to 2 meters wide. 
it was my task to, to try to find some analogies to modern physics and, and try to unravel what it could be. And what evidence were you working with? You knew that there was something called the bell that was important enough to be part of a strategic evacuation at the close of the war, right? Yes. And what you were doing then was you were putting together a puzzle from pieces of information that you collected. It started off with the interrogation protocols, which, which you just mentioned. And there was something called the bell, but you didn't know what it was. It was evidently important enough to be evacuated as part of a major strategic evacuation, I understand it, towards the end of the war. Uh, exactly. Where did you go from there? Exactly, and uh, it was stated in the original materials that uh, it was the most secret research project of the Third Reich carried out during the entire war. And uh, uh, that was uh, so amazing, so unusual, that uh, first and foremost I, I, I tried to verify such a claim. If, was it possible uh, for such a project um, involving such a strange device uh, to exist? And um, I have managed to, to find certain documents uh, confirming that such a project, which was officially codenamed Kriegsentscheidend, which means decisive for the war, that such a project did exist, in fact, and uh, it's uh, itself it it's uh, it's a breakthrough in my opinion because uh, uh, nevertheless it doesn't fit any uh, known existing uh, pattern uh, relating to to weapons at all uh, to known German weapons from the time of the war. Okay, now. If this project was labeled as Kriegsentscheiden, decisive for the war, but obviously it wasn't decisive for the war because of the turn of events in history that we all know, this implied that this research project, if that's what it was, was incomplete in some way. They, must, they made some progress, but they never finished what it was that they intended to start. Uh, yes, it, 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 it does seem so that... Uh they didn't manage to finish. I mean, the Germans didn't finish the, the project. But uh, such a classification as a decisive for the war uh, had to be based on uh, on certain science. And that was uh, the most uh, fascinating, encouraging uh, element of this puzzle. It had to be something uh, that could change the course of war. And uh, I was trying to, based on my on my previous experience of uh, military journalism and, and the historian, I was trying to uh, to develop this uh, this piece of the puzzle into a larger picture and to explain uh, what it could have been, what generally could be imagined to change the course of war on based on such a physical phenomena. Uh, as has been described in this case, uh, which were very, uh, very strange, very unusual. It was uh, frankly saying that when I uh, heard about it for the first time, uh, I mean, I heard about the physical and biological effects of the of this uh, device of the bell's operation. The first association association that came to my mind, frankly saying, was the final sequence of the from the movie, Spielberg's movie, The Writers of the Last, Lost Art, because it, it was something uh, so amazing for the Germans itself, themselves. So um, it was, certainly it was worth verifying such a, uh, such a claim in a way. What was it that led you to understand that the physical evidence for the bell was going to be in this particular location? Because you came here and then you found a whole lot of other stuff, didn't you? Exactly, that was the case, and uh, it was. Th there were some geographical names uh, in this uh, original uh, German documents. I mean, interrogation protocols of the of these Germans, and uh, among them, uh, this area has, has been mentioned around Riese, and uh, which is the underground giant underground factory. Uh, 
and uh, there was also a mention that a mine that has been uh, uh, turned over into a military research facility that this mine was used for this research from uh, December 1994, 1944 if I remember correctly and uh, mm, uh, first of all I, I, I started to look for a mine which would uh, be in the vicinity of, vicinity of the Waldenburg town uh, which is in, nearby and um, I, uh, I have found out that uh, there is just only one mine uh, in, in that area and in, indeed it, it has been um, handed over to the, to the military for military research and uh, it bears all the marks of, 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 such, a, of such a complex. And in the process then of coming here to, to check all that out then you found this this device, which or this structure, which has become known as the henge. I think was that your term for it, or was that invented by Nick Cook, who was the first Westerner, uh, or, or the first guy from America, let's mm -hmm. say, to come and check out this story based on the publication of your book, the henge. Where did that come from, and what's all that about? Uh. I wrote about it uh, as the first, and uh, the hench has never been mentioned in the original documents. It's only my guess that it might have been used for uh, for such a purposes. Uh, it's it's based on the on certain uh, similarity to the description of the uh, testing environment of the of the bell that it has been tested in uh, in a chamber underground chamber filled with water to some uh, to some level to certain level uh, in a place resembling a pool uh, mm, lined up with uh, ceramic tiles and so on so when I saw the mm, the, the pool uh, around the around the hedge it just uh, I just thought that uh, it, it might have been used as a as a test trick for for such research but it's, it's just a guess the hench in, in fact is not any proof of anything and uh, probably it wasn't used for the Germans but uh, on the um, on the other hand uh, it, it doesn't resemble any civilian construction as well yes we looked at that this morning and I must admit I was I, I was really struck by how enormous this structure is it's much much larger than the measurements of the bell which you've just described and if it is a test rig it's an enormous test rig yes because I, I, I was writing earlier uh, about uh, various aviation and, and aerospace projects I was familiar with uh, uh, such a kind of test rig which is called uh, fly trap unofficially and uh, the first uh, you know similarity or analogy that I saw was that uh, uh, it resembled such a circular test rig therefore I, I, I was uh, uh, it has uh, just brought to my mind the idea that it might have been uh, such a test uh, construction but, so, are uh, you saying the bottom photograph is the flytrap and the top yes, is the hinge? The bottom photograph is the actual modern test rig, tested uh, used uh, actually uh, to test helicopters here in helicopters. Poland. Helicopters. Yes, uh, but it refers to any uh, objects of uh, taking off and landing vertically. It's the, the same oh. principle. Wow! And uh, that was the. Analogy that it does uh, look. It looks incredibly like that. Uh, that struck me, and uh, I was trying to to explain it. Okay, and now, what is your your current theory? Just to summarize all of this, because I know this is a complicated subject. But to summarize this, and also for people who are seeing this uh, before our interview with Joseph Farrell, Joseph Farrell went into this in quite some detail on record with us. Um, and to some degree, we can refer viewers to this video to that one. But what is your personal theory about exactly what they 
they may have been doing. Um, evidently, on the basis of the original uh, descriptions, uh, the bell was a kind of a plasma accelerator. Namely, uh, there was a high voltage and high intensity uh, electric discharge inside. Insi inside such a there, there were discs or drums inside which uh, uh, were spinned in opposite directions on the same axis and inside of them there was uh, some electric discharge of high voltage uh, around a million volts as later on uh, um, it can, came out from, from the documents uh, and uh, it accelerated heavy ions namely uh, mercury mercury ions and um, it generated very strong magnetic field uh, and uh, various strange effects. And uh, what I was, uh, what I managed to 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 relate it to uh, is that. Uh, uh, sorry, I will say it again. Okay, from some some moment. It appears that the, the bell created uh, vortices of plasma, of mercury plasma, mercury ions, uh, moving with, uh, spinning with very high speeds. And uh, uh, in this case, the analogy to, to certain uh, modern uh, research and physics is such that uh, in, 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 in such a device, one can uh, achieve the speeds of uh, the order of 10% 10 10, 10 of the speed of sound. Uh, so uh, the speeds of the ions, yes. and 10% uh, of the speed of light. Yes, uh, in the Sandia laboratories in New Mexico, such a research has been carried out. But, but, but did you mean 10% of the speed of sound or light? 10% uh, of the speed of light. I see, okay. So and, could you uh, say that sentence again? Yes. It seems uh, quite clearly that the bell was a kind of a plasma accelerator, namely it uh, accelerated plasma, actually mercuric ions, uh, to very high speeds. And uh, uh, I could make a connection with modern such experiments in which uh, uh, enormous velocities are achieved at the order of 10% uh, of the speed of light and uh, therefore it created, the bell created two vortices of, of plasma uh, containing very high energy uh, and generating very uh, very high, very strong uh, magnetic fields among other things. And uh, recently uh, new documents have surfaced um, uh, saying that, original doc German documents, saying that uh, uh, in uh, one of the institutions uh, uh, affiliated with this research project, uh, the, namely the Research in Institute of the AG Consortium, uh, such a research has been in fact carried out during the war and there is a clear link to gravity. and. Uh, uh, namely, it has been—I mean, it has been written in the documents by uh, by one of the participants of this project that uh, the, the what they were. Excuse me. It has been written in a in a document uh, by uh, one of the participants in this in this research project that uh, they, among other things, they measured the velocity of the pro propagation of gravity and. Uh, and other things. Uh, also, it has been confirmed in, uh, confirmed in a document that they observed uh, very strange physical effects, such as uh, decaying of structures, decaying of neutrons, for example. And uh, therefore, uh, such a connection can be made. Uh, further on, uh, um, I was able to to connect it exactly, or, or develop this thread relating to to gravity, develop this aspect, uh, gravitational aspect, of this uh, of this device. 
One indication uh, that the uh, bear was related to gravity research was the document uh, from the actually from um, American archives from, from the paperclip files saying that the, the, there was a link between a certain project carried out in the AG Research Institute uh, which participated in this project that there is certain link with gravity. Uh, other uh, indication that uh, it was gravity related uh, comes from uh, uh, from the documents relating to to pre-war activity of a, a scientist named uh, Professor Walter Gerlach, who was uh, one of the leading scientists of the Third Reich, by the way, and uh, he uh, uh, tried to. Uh, to make such a link before the war, he carried out experiments with mercury and uh, the scientific publications papers about it, and uh, it can be verified. Uh, and uh, all these, all such elements, created a certain comprehensive picture, saying that uh, the bell was generating a, a very peculiar, a special kind of vortices, which display gravitational. Uh, uh, physical effects. Such a vortex is uh, uh, called solitons. It's a kind of a vortex which is isolated from external fields, generally. Uh, um, the, first and foremost, the magnetic field in such a vortex is isolated from external magnetic or electromagnetic fields. It's completely isolated. It's like uh, with superconductors or super liquidity. And uh, they actually made such a, uh, were making such a, such a connections, and uh, it is known. And uh, such a uh, such a vortex should have gen generate a strong anti gravitational uh, field. It's based on uh, only on uh, theoretical predictions, based on Einstein's theory, but. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any specific experiment of the same kind that would test the same uh, circumstances or uh, the same situation which the bell was testing. I'm not aware of, 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 of such an experiment, but what I can say is that uh, there is a lot of um, theoretical predictions presently uh, which say that uh, uh, that that it should generate gravitation, such a plasma vortex should gener generate a gravitational field. And uh, let me show you something. Uh, there is a there is a whole there are, there are entire books exploring these subjects, this this subject of of, of gravity related plasma research. And uh, uh, I didn't take this book actually with me, but it sorry. May I? Of of yes, of course, of because course. Because it's substance she's... Of course. You know, claim. I don't remember what it is. Yeah, there is a cover of the book. Um, I will say it again. Uh, actually, there is a lot of... Uh, no, once again. Uh, I didn't manage to find any description of a modern experiment of the exactly the same kind that was carried out in the bell by, or by the bell but there is a lot of uh, theoretical predictions by scientists which say that such a vortices named solitons should generate a gravi a gravitational or uh, anti-gravitational fields and there is a cover here of one of, of such a books uh, which is dedicated to this problem uh, the problem, the problem is, however, such that uh, uh, it's only the, these are only the theoretical predictions. Nobody has made or reproduced such a device and uh, tried to check it out. And uh, it, it's a certain quite interesting uh, phenomenon because uh, uh, what, in fact, what the Germans were trying to do with the bell was to explore quantum approach to gravity because uh, if you have ions spinning uh, moving generating fields 
it's very hard to predict or cal calculate gravitational effect of quantum phenomena. It's virtually impossible. And that's the reason why it's, uh, it's on the margin, th this entire field, which German, the Germans tried to explore, is on the margin of the modern physics, because it doesn't fit. Uh, one, one should have a, a quantum theory of gravity. There is a confirmation in modern physics, in modern science, that the German approach that I have described, uh, r relating to the bell, makes sense. But it's very difficult, if, if not almost impossible, to calculate uh, precisely any forces generated by such a device, because it's generally gravity uh, generated as a byproduct of quantum uh, effects. And uh, the Einstein's theory doesn't allow such a connection to be made. It uh, just doesn't see quantum physics. It, these are two different worlds. Uh, so, uh, what the what the German represent? What, excuse me. No, that's it about it. Okay, but what are you saying? This uh, anti gravitational field that might be created within the bell like structure uh, or the hinge structure. Are you saying this would allow, say, if it wasn't a helicopter, let's say even a disc to levitate? Is that what they might have been doing, levitating? Uh, uh, the problem with the bell is, among others, uh, such that uh, uh, clearly it was uh, or was supposed to be uh, a part of something larger. And uh, uh, I just don't know the part of what, uh, and nobody knows. And uh, 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 as far as the as the hench is concerned, uh, I was just, uh, it was my uh, you know, free assumption that uh, uh, the, the, there might have been something larger, some flying object, of which the bell, of which the bell was a part. Uh, but uh, I really don't know that. Now, many people watching this video will be familiar with the research that's been done through documents and photographs, some of which look to me to be pretty real of German flying discs in, I think it's the Hornaboo mm -hmm. series. Um, was it you who brought these to public attention or was that another research? Because this is something maybe where we can make a connection. I didn't want to connect this uh, story about the bell with uh, the so-called uh, Nazi UFO legend because uh, I cannot check it out. and. Uh, uh, what I did is uh, generally based on uh, on verifiable facts mostly and makes sense and uh, is it can be connected to modern physics and so on. So uh, I, I just didn't want to uh, you know immerse myself into such a hazy uh, stories like uh, the Nazi UFO or I, I admit such a possibility that uh, the bell could have been part of some uh, larger flying object. But uh, I didn't write about it because I, I just don't know that and uh, I cannot check it out. Okay, now, as a military historian, particularly interested in what the Nazis may have been doing, you must have been interested to check out the information from other researchers who produced photographs and I think documents with what look like blueprints. Are those photographs and documents authentic or, or do you just not know? Why is it that that doesn't feel like compelling evidence to you? Because it looks very dramatic. I'm not sure if the blue, so-called blueprints of the Nazi UFOs look uh are uh, uh, genuine. I just cannot check it out, and uh, therefore, I because I I knew that I will not be able to check it out. I wasn't interested in this story. Uh, um, I don't know that. I, I, I so, but you're taking, you're saying you found this bell, the hinge structure, and it was painted with a uh, camouflage. Isn't this true? Yes. Uh, uh, the so-called hinge is uh, looks like a finished structure. In the in the case of um, 
supporting structure for a cooling tower. It would be completely inside the cooling tower, which is generally filled with uh, very heat, very hot uh, uh, water vapor. And uh, such a uh, green camouflage paint, not the plaster, it wouldn't make sense just uh, because uh, anyway it would be hidden inside of a, of a larger structure. So. Uh, it just didn't seem to me to be part of a, of a, of such a, a cooling tower. Uh, one more uh, fact suggesting that it wasn't uh, um, to be a supporting structure for a cooling tower is that uh, there there are no foundation underneath the the hinge to support such a, something that large because it would have to be a some 30 uh, stories high there is there, there are no foundation for such for such a thing uh, one question that arose in my mind when i was trying to research uh, or investigate the, the physical aspect of the bell was that uh, the question whether it was in germany in the third reich any physical theory that would uh, allow to perceive uh, at all uh, vortices of plasma as, as sources of gravity and to my amazement I, I have found one there was a, a German professor named Pasqual Jordan who has developed such a theory during the war and still is almost unknown but it was the first physical theory that treated vortices as sources of gravity that's the piece of the puzzle that convinced me that it all makes sense and in fact I'm, uh, I have a co-worker who is a scientist specializing in this field and for him uh, it also makes sense so it's not any uh, uh, pure fantasy or something it's a, it's a real scientific challenge to this day Sure, I must say what interests me about this is that if we take that that sort of logical line of deduction which you've been presenting that they seem to be experimenting with some uh, advanced practical technical way of creating an anti-gravity effect it really does look like that and if this was a war decisive technology the next stage in the logic is they were trying to get something to fly in an advanced means of flying propulsion and so I can't help then but take that logic to the fact that they were trying to get something to fly that might have been a disc-shaped object and a disc-shaped object is perfect to have something rotating inside some rotating plasma effect it does seem to fit with some of these stories rumors photographs documents that we've seen showing the apparent existence of a very primitive sort of flying disc but it just interests me that you don't feel that you can go there because there's no evidence. I mean, those photographs look real to me. Uh, yes, but uh, looking at this, at such a photographs of the so-called Nazi UFOs uh, wouldn't contribute to my research at all because uh, they they don't convey any any substantial information, and uh, it wouldn't, you know, th there is nothing, there is no entry to any new field in this way. Okay. Uh, you said very interesting and good thing that connecting this with a uh, word decisive uh, because it would be such a breakthrough now just looking again at the fact that we know that this was a war it was labeled as a war decisive project and it seems to have had something to do with anti-gravity effects at that time there were some very cutting edge physics involved, there's some very smart people involved in this project and clearly the Nazis put a lot of resources behind this and labelled it um, at the highest level of secrecy they had. What is your personal idea about what this could have been used for? It might have been used for, as a part of a strategic weapons, namely as a element of the propulsion system and uh, uh, a scientist working with me on on this uh, as a consultant has uh, once uh, said that uh, 
if they would master such a technology, indeed it would be a greater breakthrough than construct than building a, a nuclear weapon, because uh, uh, it would be opening of the n entire new area of physics, field of physics, and it would allow them to to make uh, a weapon carrying uh, chemical and nuclear uh, warheads, for example, or weapons, uh, against which there would be no defense, as uh, against the V2, there was no defense effectively. And uh, it would allow them really to, to conquer the world. And uh, I believe that um, the war would be over very quickly in, uh, in such a case. Uh, one may say also that uh, the Germans didn't have uh, nuclear weapons to, to, to exploit such a breakthrough, but they also had uh, chemical weapons and uh, they were frankly saying much more deadly and lethal. It was the newest generation of neurogases, so-called, uh, which was so effective that uh, they really could inflict major losses within a week or within a couple of days. And uh, such a breakthrough certainly would be decisive for the war. So, therefore, also from this point of view, it makes sense. Now, okay, uh, sorry. I have to the, say that I don't understand how the anti gravity. Uh, yes, okay. How does that, that link up with the uh -huh. delivery system? How, how, how is that? If it's not a UFO, what is it? such a breakthrough in physics, in mastery, in gravity, uh, would enable the Germans to, to make uh, a kind of uh, platform object, flying object, against which there would be no defense, which, could be, uh, which would be able to reach uh, any corner of the world and deliver the most uh, destructive or lethal weapons that they have. Perhaps the Germans didn't have the nuclear weapons, but uh, they also had a very destructive uh, chemical arsenal, uh, in, uncomparable in, uh, in every respect with, uh, with the Allied chemical uh, or bio biological arsenals. It would be very deadly and uh, such a weapon that would enable uh, them to deliver these weapons of mass destruction to uh, the major cities of the United States, for example, would certainly be uh, decisive for the war, and uh, the losses would, uh, on the Allied side, would, would would rise in such a dramatic, uh, at such a dramatic pace that uh, uh, probably it would end the war. Now, let me ask you about nuclear weapons because Joseph Farrell and I think also Jim Mars and they're both pretty good researchers they believe that the Nazis may have been on the verge of developing a workable nuclear weapon in your opinion is this possible? The Germans were uh, much closer to manufacturing nuclear weapons than is uh, generally thought and uh, I personally have a uh, recovered uh, several documents from various archives saying that uh, this describing for example uh, places where the uh, uh, nuclear weapons were actually manufactured uh, or uh, revealing completely new uh, segments of the of the German nuclear program if there was such by the way because uh, it was so it is called compartmentalization to divide various elements so that there is no, uh, I would say, horizontal connection between them uh, and they know, uh, don't know about each other. I have personally recovered many such documents saying that uh, uh, the German nuclear program was far more advanced than uh, it was previously thought, especially in the West, mostly because uh, these facilities were located in the so-called latter eastern zone. Therefore, the Allied, uh, the intelligence services of the of the Western Allies, didn't have any access to them. They were located here in the Lower Silesia, in the in the Czech Republic, which was nicknamed by Hitler himself as the SS Dukedom, 
uh, and uh, the Western researchers never had any uh, idea about it. Apart from the valley with the Henge, there is a, the Riza vicinity, which was supposed to be the second largest uh, underground armament complex of the Third Reich. And uh, we, in fact, are in the middle of it. I mean, very close to it. And uh, it was uh, su supposed to serve as a final production assembly line uh, of uh, devoted to the project uh, of the bell. Uh, therefore, one may draw a conclusion that the bell was uh, supposed to be part of a larger weapon that was supposed to be produced here, manufactured here. And uh, uh, although the Riese uh, was supposed to be the second largest underground facility in the Third Reich, uh, it was also a small fragment of a much larger complex. I have uh, recovered documents about it from signed by Kamler, by General Kamler as, uh, himself, uh, which says that the that the the Riese was part of a, as they called it a. Uh, uh, S3 uh, special construction and undertaking it, in German it was uh, Sonderbau for Haben S drive uh, and uh, the documents signed by General Kamler himself says that uh, it was the largest SS project of the entire war and it's uh, uh, it could have been some uh, equivalent of the American Manhattan Project because uh, there was a connection between the carry means of carrying carrying systems for the weapons of mass destruction, perhaps involving the bell, and uh, and the weapons of mass destruction themselves. Uh, one of the prisoners working here has uh, mentioned that, that that there was a clear connection between this facility and the chemical arsenal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a scientist a researcher uh, who worked for the, for the government and uh, in the early 60s has has found remnants of, of some radioactive substances. I, I could personally uh, uh, mention a couple of names of people who died because of radioactivity here. And, uh, when you say here, where exactly uh, do you mean? Could you show us on the map? What yeah, I can show you on the, ma on the map. This is the map showing all the, the, the mountain massive in, in which the, the Riese complex has been uh, ex excavated. And uh, there are specific facilities, such as here, here, underground facilities, here, uh, here, a, a lot of them around the entire massive. And uh, along with that, there was uh, also uh, uh, you know, infrastructure for such a construction site, such as sidings of uh, a narrow gauge railway uh, here, sub camps of the concentration camp, barracks of the SS. Uh, in various places around, there, there, there were there, there was around forty thousand people, forty fifty thousand people working on it. Uh, uh, for a couple of years. Where was the Henge in, in reference to this? The, the Henge in reference to this is some five kilometers to the to the south. It's it's uh, out of the map. Riese, the underground facility is uh, is inside of the mountain massive, uh, on the under the entire mountain massive, and on the other side of this massive. Uh, there was a there, there was a set of bunkers, much like in the near the Henge itself, uh, only that they they were located mostly underground and uh, camouflaged. And uh, in one of such a, of such bunkers, supposedly, uh, uh, three people found a substance uh, resembling mercury, only that it was denser. Uh, and uh, all of them died of uh, leukemia and cancer and such a things. And uh, I, I I knew one of them, and uh, I can say that uh, it's it's just a fact. Is that substance, or is it possible that that substance, is what has been referred to in documents? And you may need to remind me here. It's called zerum five two five. I think it. Have I got that right? I know people 
that were killed. I, I'm I'm only not sure what killed them, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, because of the because they died of leukemia, various forms of cancer. It 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 seems likely to me. They described it uh, when they lived here. They described the substance as something uh, resembling mercury, only that it was uh, a, something jelly-like, not entirely liquid, such mm. a strange uh, state of matter. And uh, it re it reminded me of uh, of the substance that was supposedly placed inside the bell, in the core of the bell, not mm. in the cylinders that were spinned. Mm. Uh, which was code named serum or serum five to five, mm -hmm. and um, it just from the description it, it just seemed something si very similar, but I'm not sure because I didn't see it. Did they uh, say what color it was? They didn't. Okay. They didn't. What really interests me about this, because th this is all a big detective story that that you're putting together here is that it was the single most it, it was the largest uh, SS project in the war and yet we know almost nothing about it I mean that's really quite a big clue in itself as to its importance and as you said the level of secrecy like the uh, Nazi equivalent to the Manhattan Project that's fascinating yes it, it is indeed fascinating but uh, we should uh, bear in mind that uh, uh, the SS had certain advantages for them, uh, namely that they had, to, to a large extent, that they, they, they had uh, their own financing. They didn't have to report to any external institutions outside, I mean, the, outside their empire. The, the most significant advantage of the SS, uh, from the point of view of the Thirshaik itself, was that uh, uh, they had uh, their own workforce in the form of prisoners. There was a specially uh, raised uh, uh, concentration camp, Grosrosen, here nearby. And uh, uh, such a prisoners were um, called by them as Geheimnisträger, which means somebody who is carrying literally the secret, which means that uh, uh, they were connected with the secret until forever and ever and ever. They couldn't come out and say and tell anybody else. Outside, so. Uh, but were there any survivors? Uh, yes, it's a good, very good question. Uh, none of the twenty over twenty thousand prisoners working in the finished central section of the Riza has survived. One of the prisoners of the Grossrosen, who was a writer in the in the camp, has uh, testified after the war to the special commission that he has, he has, every day he has reported uh, uh, the number of prisoners working, living every day to the SS, uh, uh, to the people of the, from the SS. And uh, one day he has uh, told them that, uh, sirs, there, there must have been some mistake because the, the number has changed by, 20, by over 20,000. And they, they smiled and said, told him that, no, there is no mistake. It's okay. That's really sinister, isn't it? That's so. Yes, and probably yeah. the, they have been uh, uh, closed inside this facility, the central section of the reason. What you're really saying here, then, it, w w which is something that that many people in the modern world might not f fully understand, is that the SS they had their own financing, they had their own resources, they had their own workforce, they had. Um, they were were insulated from the rest of the Nazi party and basically they could do anything they wanted to and they had really no controls over them whatsoever, is that right? Uh, that's exactly true because uh, the Third Reich has uh, occupied many countries and they uh, used various uh, or employed various companies, uh, forced laborers from various countries and uh, normally it was quite hard to, to to keep something to keep something secret, especially invol involving uh, tens of thousands of people, and the SS was only so the only solution to such a problem, because they could do uh, they could solve this. Okay. Yeah, I, okay. I, I understand. Okay, but wh okay, I, I think what uh, where were these? You say there was a camp nearby here. 
Yes, the, the, the Gross Rosen concentration camp. I see. And is it known? Is it location? Is the location known? The location is known, but uh, the only uh, really the only part that was left was a, is a gate and uh, some foundations for the for the barracks because. Uh, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, a concentration camp like Auschwitz, for example, uh, uh, which was a mass extermination camp. It was, uh, in this case, the camp Grossrosen was really only a distribution center for the workforce. And the, the, the prisoners didn't stay there for long. They, they could stay for a week or something, but not for long. And uh, the entire uh, workforce, the, all the prisoners worked in, in sub-camps uh, mm -hmm. attached to, to, to specific undertakings. It's like a temporary holding camp. Yes, a distribu just a distribution center. So, but where, where were the prisoners kept? Uh, they were kept in, in, in wooden barracks mostly. Some of them lived underground in the, in the tunnels. There is a difference between uh, uh, the parts of the reason that we know uh, today uh, which contribute to some 80,000 cubic meters underground. And uh, German data from the, from the uh, time of the war, uh, when um, the armament minister, for example, has stated, uh, according to some report from uh, September of 1944, that uh, over 220,000 cubic meters was uh, already made, uh, underground, so there is uh, some 150,000 cubic meters missing, and uh, it's certainly, I mean, mm, everything indicates that it's uh, it's the central part of the of the massive, which uh, holds the the finished part where uh, the prisoners were working on something, pre manufacturing something already before the end of the war, and probably they have been. Uh, uh, the, the entrances have been blasted off and uh, they have been closed uh, underground. Would that have been part of the strategic evacuation? Uh, yes, pretty much. The, probably the same uh, office of the Rice Central Security Office was dealing with that. And uh, evacuations were just an extension of, of, of such measures uh, aimed at securing crucial potential for the post-war period. When you were traveling here in the car, you used a term that I found most interesting, which was strategic evacuation. And that indicated to me that this process of evacuating to wherever they evacuated to, and whatever they evacuated, and whoever they evacuated, after the war was something that was carefully planned. It was like a strategic withdrawal. It wasn't just everyone running for the door. It was something that was a carefully coordinated military plan. Now, when do you think that plan was established? How soon before the formal end of the war did they start to think, you know what, we're not going to make this through as we planned. We're going to have to go to plan B. And what do you think that plan B was? This is something that's hugely interesting. And, and of course, just to continue that question, for some people who suspect that many of the key Nazis and maybe much of the technology survived the war and was exported elsewhere, this is a really important question. The Germans were forced initially by, by the Allied air raids to, to develop a set of operations aimed at securing the crucial, most crucial potential. Uh, initially, just to prevent it from being de destroyed by, by the Allied bombs, but the extension of these operations were the so-called strategic e evacuations aimed at evacuating the most crucial resources such as scientific uh, heritage of the Third Reich and so on, abroad. Uh, there was a set of deals signed with, uh, with, with, with Japan and with Argentina and uh, a, uh, that was to facilitate such evacuations and uh, in fact everything uh, indicates that the Bell project was evacuated to Argentina and, and was continu continued for some time because the, the, there is a clear uh, connection and continuity, one of the several, 
I mean not one but several people from the project continued to work in Argentina and uh, they also mentioned later on about the uh, gravitational aspect of the plasma physics and so on. Uh, so who who were these people that were running this whole uh, part of the SS um, Evacuation. Uh, well, not just the evacuation, but also the RISA facility. Who were these people? Uh, the institution responsible for this project involving RISA and the larger vicinity, which was codenamed S3, a special construction undertaking S3, was the Kammler's office. Uh, it was called Sonderstab, which means special staff, for special undertakings uh, related to armament production, the most state of the world, uh, the most s involving the most uh, state of the art weapons. Sorry about. Okay, uh, but uh, so it was Himmler, you're saying? Yes, the SS generally. Yeah, but, but we, who who particularly from the SS? When you say they also continued their work in South America, what who were we talking about? The SS was. Uh, coordinating the the research, the, the project as such, but wasn't involved in the research. There, there were no SS scientists in it. Who so, was uh, involved? Do we know the names of anybody? Yes, we do. The most important was Professor Walter Derla, who was responsible for the physical aspect of the of this project. Which the project was uh, codenamed Chronos uh, slash Laternan Trigger. Uh, the one code named refer, uh, referred to the physical aspect of it, the other one uh, referred to medical or biological aspect. And I, uh, it's not certain which one referred to which one. But uh, the project was called named Chronos. Which means time. Uh, it that doesn't means mean time exactly. It, it means uh, a Greek god. Yes, it is a god. Okay. And he was Who gave god people something. Okay. I don't remember now, but it's a very interesting legend about it. I mean, as far as Greek mythology is concerned, it's not time as such. Okay. Uh, it's it's interesting. Worth checking it it out. The most important person was Professor Walter Gerla in this project, who was responsible for the physical aspect of it. He researched on the spinning of mercury ions extensively before the war. Try to connect it with the so-called isolated vortices, which means solitons. It's all verified, published, and so on. The other person was SS Gruppenfuhrer Ernst Robert Gravitz. He was the only SS scientist in the team who was responsible for the medical and biological effects uh, aspect of this project, and uh, he was chief of the Institute of Hygiene of the of the Waffen SS. Uh, but he committed suicide uh, before the end of the war. What about Werner Braun von Braun? Braun? There, was no, there is no indication saying that uh, Werner von Braun or all the uh, rocket scientists were involved in this project. Except for one. There is one who was, uh, whose name was uh, Kurt Debus, who was responsible for the uh, high voltage uh, equipment related to the bell and uh, he worked later uh, for the for NASA he was one of the directors of NASA Joseph Farrell showed us some interesting photographs of Kurt Debus and Werner von Braun together at NASA which is an interesting question true yes. this remains unanswered working what on rocket not just NASA but working in Florida on on a mm -hmm. rocket program Debus was on one of the few the only one scientist that was uh, recruited from Penemünde, and uh, that's probably why he has, he has been uh, employed by the NASA after the war, becoming one of its uh, directors. Uh, there is no indication at all, I mean, uh, at least I, I didn't found any, uh, saying that the, this uh, project or entire this field, or this entire field of physics was continued in the United States after the war. I couldn't find anything except for the very modern uh, research by Sandia Laboratories, which were uh, experimenting with with such vortices and so on. Uh, but 
shortly after the war, no, I, I couldn't find any, any confirmation that it was continued or evacuated in the United States or evacuated to the United States. But the implication of, of, of what you're saying is that if the personnel and resources and the bell itself were evacuated maybe to Argentina, then presumably that would have been with the intention of the project being continued there. What happened to that? The continuation of the project in Argentina took place until the fall of the Peron government. Uh, after that, the entire research team has been disbanded. Uh, um, the main scientist, which was Ronald Richter, started fearing about his life, and as far as I know, he has escaped from Argentina. So, it was continued, uh, but to some uh, to some extent. Uh, I'm not sure if it, if it was finished. When I was talking with one of the directors of the research center built for the Germans there, uh, he suggested me cle to me clearly that uh, it's still a, a subject of secrecy and uh, he has no access to such documents. But that's fast. I mean, this is something which we haven't heard about in in this detail. That's fascinating. So you're saying that it is known that there is a research facility in Argentina that was devoted to this Nazi science, and you've got access into some of those details? Yes, there is a, a set of documents pertaining to uh, work carried out in the Research Institute of the AG Consortium during the war uh, by Debus and by uh, Richter, who was continuing the project in Argentina. There is a clear reference in these documents to be, uh, connection between plasma physics and, uh, and gravity, and the same connection appears later on uh, in the Argentine context. But it was discontinued for unclear reasons. Okay, but what are you saying in terms of the evacuation committee, the relationship between the evacuation committee and these scientists who are working here? Mm -hmm. Wasn't there some relationship between the SS, who were evacuation, who were in charge of the evacuation, and the scientists who were working on the project here? Uh, there was no such a direct relation because the, uh, a different body was responsible for the evacuation. D different institution was responsible for the evacuation, and uh, a different one coordinated the research uh, itself here. So there is no connection between the evacuation persons from personnel from the evacuation and the scientists. No direct connection. But weren't the scientists evacuated? Uh, some of the scientists were evacuated, but not all of them. Uh, two went up in Argentina, ended up in Argentina, which is Richter. Uh, there was some engineer from the AG, associated with the AG Research Institute, named Hellman, who continued the, the work out there in Argentina. But I don't remember all the details now. Okay, and where are the other scientists? Where did the other scientists go, if not to Argentina? Uh, frankly saying, I, I, I know only about... Uh, uh, three, four, or five uh, persons associated with this project. Uh, of course, the, num the number has, has to be uh, higher, but uh, I know just about a, a few of them. And uh, the, the most significant, uh, Professor Walter Gerlach was uh, uh, stayed in Germany after the war, but he never uh, not only returned to what he was doing du during the war, but he never published any uh, scientific publications. Uh, about uh, uh, the same subjects in which he was involved in before the war, for example, he just completely detached himself from the from the from this field of physics. What about the other four? Uh, Debus was employed by NASA in the United States, although he was uh, an uh, SS officer, and that ardent one, uh, and he never uh, wasn't interested as well to go back to, the, to such uh, subjects, because uh, uh, one can imagine that it involved accus possible accusations uh, 
uh, about uh, experiments on humans or wanting to, you know, uh, wipe out some significant part of the population of the United States, for example, which employed him. So he wasn't interested in going back to such subjects either. One of the scientists, Professor and SS Gruppenführer, Ernst Gravitz, committed suicide before the end of the war, so there is, uh, this trade has disconnected. And the other ones, uh, I, I don't know details about the fates. Okay. Uh, what happened to Hans Kammler? And maybe just tell us a little bit about who Hans Kammler was yeah. and why he was such an important figure. Because of various reasons, uh, Hitler has decided to um, entrust the management of uh, the most uh, um, secret and most state-of-the-art armament projects in the hands of uh, one man who was uh, uh, SS General uh, Hans Kammler, who was very skilled organizer and um, very ruthless as well. But uh, uh, um, he was, uh, in a way, materialization of a uh, uh, SS of the of, of a certain trend of SS grasping uh, even more uh, fields of the uh, German economy, and uh, uh, among other things, Kammler has uh, controlled all the production of jet fighters, of jet airplanes, of the uh, rocket missiles, and various other uh, fields and. Uh, he became very influential person in the Third Reich, but uh, it is completely unclear what happened to him. He has disappeared in the in the occupied Czech uh, territories, and um, the, there is no, uh, never uh, any any trace has surfaced which would indicate that he ended up in some other country or something. Uh, I don't know, but... Uh, it's, so he, he was he, instrumental, though. You're saying that he was basically running, uh, for all intents and purposes, this RISA um, faci facility yeah. or complex Pro or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was instrumental in controlling not only the RISA and the, S the larger S3 undertaking, but uh, all the, virtually all the... Uh, most uh, state-of-the-art and uh, crucial uh, armament projects uh, of the Third Reich by the end of the war. And uh, he, then he has vanished. He just disappeared somewhere uh, in, the, in the occupied uh, Czech territories. And uh, th there was never any trace of him uh, after the war. Was there ev ever any indication that Hitler visited the Reise? Uh there are rumors that he did, but uh, and uh, nearby there was an uh, underground uh, headquarters, Hitler's headquarters, under construction. But personally, I believe that he didn't visit it because it would uh, attract attention of the of the enemies to this place, which was still almost unknown, except except for the Russians, which were which were very well oriented in this business. What do you mean the Russians were well oriented in this business? Several years ago I, I have talked with a man who was an uh, employee of the Academy of the General Staff in Poland, military, and he told me about uh, who coordinated, for example, the uh, uh, scientific uh, aspect of the intelligence reconnaissance of this area uh, on the Russian side, and uh, he has mentioned uh, a certain person he, who uh, Lev Andreevich Artsemovich, academician, which is something higher than professor in the former Soviet Union. And uh, uh, as later uh, I have uh, checked out, he was uh, specializing in thermonuclear physics and plasma physics, and exactly was more or less the equivalent of Gerla, so they had to have a pretty uh, good and clear idea about what was going on here, contrary to the to the Western Allies. This sounds like there must have been some kind of on-the-ground relationship between the Russians 
and the Germans during that time? Yes, it's a very interesting question and such a relationship can be traced back to the pre-war period in a very uh, strange and uh, amazing way, namely that uh, Professor Walter Gerla, who was uh, trying to make something on the basis of such a vortices that I mentioned on the solidons, has consulted the Soviet Nobel Prize winner Peter Kapitza, who was of Polish origin by the way, his parents were, were Polish, and uh, because Kapitza has developed a theory describing such a vortices before the war. It pertained to so-called superfluidity, but the description is the same because uh, this are almost the same kinds of uh, vortices. Uh, so there was such a cooperation. Mm. Uh, probably Kapitza or the Soviet partner of, of Gerlach wasn't aware of what's the, what was the purpose of that. and. Uh, of, of, obviously, it was before the, the 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 beginning of the war with the Soviet Union, but there is such a there are some certain connections between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union in this respect, uh, often amazing ones. Let me ask you a question, um, which goes into a different area here. I'm still really interested in the the. Argentina connection mm -hmm. and how you say that as far as you can tell that activity ceased uh, round about the breakup of the Perón administration but surely after the war the Americans would have been very aware of what was happening in Argentina their intelligence capacity would have informed them of what they were doing uh, surely the Americans knew about all of this I'm not sure if the Americans knew this, because uh, just an example that gives some idea. There was a, a very ambitious effort by the uh, Israeli special services to kill the uh, Nazi war criminals hiding in Argentina after the war. And uh, it all failed. And uh, as far as I know from the materials that I saw, uh, commonly known, only that uh, it may not be known in the UK or the United States, but it's based on the on the materials published in Poland. Uh, it seems that uh, they didn't even manage to work out how the Nazi organizations work in Argentina. They didn't really have an idea. That's my impression. So I'm not really sure it was a very well organized system created by the Germans in Argentina. It was not a group of amateurs. They were all professionals and it was pre-arranged and very well planned. And uh, it worked like a professional system and has uh, had a backing of the, uh, of the Argentine services such as counterintelligence. They co-worked with each other. And, uh, I wouldn't say that it's so obvious that uh, the United States knew about was, what was going on uh, at the time. I, I, I'm not that sure. There must have been something in it for Argentina as a state. Though. There must have been some, some quid pro quo, some exchange for Argentina, for them to have taken this risk of harboring all of this activity, these resources, this scientists, this technology. Yes, there was a, a kind of a deal mm -hmm. between the Germans and certain people or services from Argentina, because not with Argentina as such, uh, a deal in which the Argentines got the technology which they, which they tried to develop later on. Uh, they got a lot of money from the capitals of the of the Nazi Party of the SS of the of the Third Reich uh, as a, as a whole, uh, in exchange providing uh, security and uh, some kind of um, hideout for these people, uh, it was kind of of a deal and uh, mutually beneficial. But wasn't didn't you say that there were companies? that developed a relationship, I think maybe you even said, yeah. even before the war with uh, the uh, Germans, uh, with Argentine companies 
because there were materials in Argentina that they were bringing and shipping over here yes. for use, even perhaps in the Reza uh, area. Always, uh, the Germany maintained a, a very um, high level uh, industrial links with Argentina or commercial links even before the war and uh, because there is a, a, that's one of the reasons because there is a, a very high um, German minority there it, it may not be very num numerous but it is influ influential and uh, always was influential and this this personal connections or connections between institutions for example Peron was educated in a German military academy. Later on, he served as a Argentine military attaché in Berlin. And so they didn't really have to look far for, for such a connection. It, it, it was natural. And the natural extension of, of such links was that during the war, Argentina as a neutral country has provided uh, precious, war, uh, precious for the war uh, raw materials for the Third Reich. And later on, the same connections, the same links, the same uh, organizational uh, infrastructure was used to evacuate certain things to, to Argentina. So there was a fluent transition from one uh, stage to another. It, it was but what, weren't there also certain raw materials that are special? In other words, they can't be found in Europe that you said that the that Germany was getting from Argentina. Yes, Argentina was a kind of a gateway to the entire South America from which they could obtain uh, various uh, precious materials such as platinum, such as tungsten, uh, a whole lot of, of, of stuff. And uh, it worked very well. Argentina could ship it to, to Spain, for example. Uh, or to Sweden, uh, even uh, grains such as rye, uh, food, uh, in large numbers, and uh, it worked very well. What about the, the close proximity to Antarctica, of Argentina? <sighs> For a long time, I thought that uh, it's a kind of a fantasy that uh, 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 Antarctica, the Antarctic played uh, a role in such uh, measures. But uh, once I have received a signal uh, saying that um, the contrary, it was very strange because I, I, I just thought that I, I just couldn't imagine uh, Antar the Antarctic being used for such a, to build a base, for example, because there is a it's not a place to live. There, there is no infrastructure, nothing at all. And uh, moreover, everything is visible from the air. But uh, apparently, there was some um, a net of supplying bases, provisional bases, out there. Maybe not exactly in the Antarctic, but on the islands surrounding. Antarctic line between the Antarctic and the South America, for example. Because once I have, uh, I had such a signal, yes, that uh, there was there, there was some some Germans were performing some duty there. When you mean a signal, do you mean do you mean a clue? Do you mean some information? Do you mean something that somebody told you? What do, what does that mean? A signal. One of the clues that the our services had after the war about the evacuation of these things, uh, about the activity of the evacu Special Evacuations Commander, to be exact, uh, was coming from a German courier which was contacting the agents left here. I mean, not exactly in this area, but somewhere else, but also related to this research and to the activity of the Evacuation Commander. And uh, uh, he was arrested and uh, testified, but he didn't know very much. Basically, the only thing that he knew is that uh, these things had been evacuated somewhere to some place lying far in the south. 
he was uh, he came from Uruguay, so one could guess that it's about South America or farther in the south. But uh, he has only mentioned one geographical name or name of a company. It wasn't certain what it was. Uh, name anyway, a Boris. Uh, and uh, for years and for decades, various people, as far as I know, were trying before me, trying to unravel what it was, what it could have been, and nobody has ever found any clue about it. But once unexpectedly I have received such a, such a signal, such an information, namely that uh, one of the crucial persons involved in the evacuations, generally of the uh, evacuations of the SS, and I, I, I don't know if he knew about anything about the bell so, and so on, but one of the crucial persons on the part of the SS, as far as the evacuations were concerned, to South America was a certain um, officer named Gottfried Sandstede, working there as, uh, as an agent, and uh, my friend, a friend of mine, Colin, has managed to talk to his son. And uh, his son has said that uh, two things, that the Boris existed. I mean, he didn't really want to talk about it, but it was an easy subject for him. But uh, such, a, uh, such a thing as a Boris did exist, and it was a base for the submarines in Argentina. Uh, and the other thing he has just shortly mentioned, that his father has shortly, for a short time, for half a year after the war, has uh, served uh, duty in, uh, in, on the Antarctic. And the, the, it was the only confirmation that uh, saying that uh, uh, the Antarctic played some role in such an evacuation. Although I, I, I disregarded this it initially because it didn't make didn't seem possible for me to, to, to establish anything of that. I remember that Joseph Farrell showed us some photographs of this huge Junkers six engine plane that was known to have evacuated a lot of material to Norway, I believe it was. Is that right? Have I understood that right? And, yes. and if so, what happened after that? Yes, there was a special plane, in fact, appropriated by Hans Kammler, who was coordinating, played some part in the evacuations as well. And this plane supposedly took the I'm not sure, something related to the, to the Bell project or to the Chronos project. I'm not sure if it was the Bell itself or the, just the documentations, but something related to the project. And landed in Norway, in the border base uh, in the north of Norway, which was one of the few relatively safe air bases that the Germans had at the end of the war. And uh, then for some time the trace has vanished. I mean, no plane, nothing. And often, only after many years, uh, my co-worker co from, from Santa America, from Uruguay, has reported to me that uh, there is a photograph of this uh, plane that, w that was supposedly made near the town of, in the uh, airstrip, on the airstrip in the, uh, in the jungle near the town of Gualeguay in Uruguay and uh, supposedly uh, the shipment has been moved to Argentina, evacuated to, to, to Bariloche in Argentina and the plane was, uh, they, they just got rid, of, rid of, of the plane in the leaving it in the pulling it into a into the Uruguay River, and supposedly in, it is still lying on the on the on the river, but uh, I didn't check it out. That's a fascinating story. That plane could have it, it had the range to go from Norway to Argentina or to Uruguay, it if necessary. Had, it, it didn't have the range to to go to Argentina directly because it's uh, around fifteen thousand kilometers or so from Norway. 
but uh, it could go to to Uruguay. Uh, and uh, in fact, it was one of the very few airplanes uh, um, able to refuel in flight. That's interesting. I didn't know they had that technology in, yeah, in, okay. in the war. Um, but also, didn't you say that there were um, thousands evacuated? Wasn't I there mean, a number, did you say 50,000? Around 50,000 Germans emigrated or more officially or, or unofficially or under false names uh, to Argentina. It, that, that's what is estimated. And uh, uh, the question is how many of them were really uh, evacuated uh, in a pre-planned way. Uh, it is estimated that uh, the order of 5,000 or 10 percent. It's hard to say, really. That's a fascinating mystery again. We've got mysteries within mysteries here. There's so much yeah. that's still unknown, even 60 years later. I, still I, I remember, it may not be for the record as you wish, but uh, just, just a curious detail. I remember a documentary in which uh, some uh, a Jew has uh, was um, you know telling his story about uh, his emigration to to South America where he had uh, some family after shortly after the war he 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 wanted to go to to Argentina but he, they didn't let him in obviously. Uh, so he took a ship to to Uruguay, which is on the other side of the of the La Plata River, and uh, he recalled one one day in the afternoon on the ship, uh, some some somebody has raised a glass of wine or something, and saying to to somebody else on by the other table that. Her captain, you have killed five thousand Jews, and raised the glass. <laughs> That's amazing. It was, no, it was really yeah. what was what they were doing out there in Argentina. They they knew that they are safe, and uh, they did it pretty much openly. I mean, um, mm. for example, one of the key persons uh, in the in the Nazi structure, in the organization, in, in Bariloche, has a, had a false name, for example, but uh, when he established a, a company out there, the company had, uh, you know, the SS runs in the, in the name, in the log. So it was pretty much shop. Yeah, there's so many... Oh, very so interesting. Um, what is... Uh, I, I just have to ask, this mountain you say that the entrance I or mean, he, yes here, yeah. here you're saying that we're quite close to you're saying the entrance seemed to have been bombed or closed uh blown up blown up because you know uh, if you want to blow up uh, entrance uh, tunnel you drill holes at a uh, depth of actually in this case the order of two meters and the explosive charge is placed on the at the end of the of the of the hole. So when it is uh, when it explodes, you then have a uh, pieces of rock with holes going through from one side to another. You know, so from the from that you can you can guess that it has been uh, it didn't collapse naturally. Yeah, I understand that. I've seen things like that in mines. I, I will show you that because it's a yeah. you know fifteen minutes work. <laughs> But where, not in these conditions. I see. But 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 do you have any evidence, or have you gotten any evidence mm -hmm. uh, that when it was closed down, down, when did they close it off? No, nothing. Only that um, you know piece of information from the from the former prisoners from Gross Rosen. A very very few people have sur have survived accidentally. I mean, there was an evacuation, you know. In March or April 1945, there were trains going from one station to another and then back because the front has shifted from unexpectedly and such things. And and sometimes it happens that uh, that a prisoner managed to escape from such a train. You know, it was complete chaos at that time. But uh, as I mentioned, 
all, all those who worked in the finished part of the Riza have been just in, never lived, never left this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their secrets died with them. That was the simplest, simplest method. The simplest method. These guys, it's very. Very hard for us to understand. Approach. Yeah, pragmatic. So what you're saying is, uh, it, it, you're talking about twenty thousand prisoners. Just isn't, over isn't twenty thousand. Yeah. Um, now, in in terms so, of so, supposedly they were driven underground for t it took tr three days, because you know, uh, twenty thousand it's a population of a small town. You, you just don't. It's not like entering the bus. You know, just going. So it's a lot of people. So whole trains. You're saying it took three days. Are you so, saying supposedly? I knew a guy from uh, our services who collected materials. He's dead. I collected mat uh, such materials, and a man gathered things. Uh, supposedly, he had such a, a testimony or document. I don't. I don't. I don't know what it was. Um, but this wouldn't this? I mean, in a sense, I, I don't know what the the actual numbers were for the. For the death of, of the people in the various camps in in Nazi Germany, but the overall numbers. How mm -hmm. does this twenty thousand uh, compare, for example, to the number who died at uh, Auschwitz and so on? It's very little. Uh, all these uh, prisoners, the number of all these prisoners going through the Grossrosen concentration camp was relatively low. It was I, I don't know really. I don't I don't know. But it's the order of of one hundred thousand compared to around uh, three uh, three and a half million exterminated in Auschwitz, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, so it, it wasn't much, but uh, you know, all the, the combined number of prisoners going through the subcamps of the Riza was was around forty or fifty thousand. So uh, twenty thousand in this in this respect was quite a, quite a lot. So generally, very few people have survived who who have anything to say about it. Mm. Very few. Yes, it's not a question of these guys going into an extermination camp. They were just presumably exterminated once they ceased to become useful. It's this is the expedient approach mm -hmm. which these guys had. Exactly. Only uh, the project, uh, gen the generally, the pro may I say, is... Uh, yes. Yes, Mr. Uh, Long. Apparently, the entire project was a result of a cooperation between the SS and the Luftwaffe, who, has, uh, who had a monopoly on the uh, Air Force, generally. Luftwaffe is Air Force in German. And uh, the Luftwaffe wanted to create uh, much better conditions for the, for the prisoners. And uh, in according to the to the prisoner who worked in technical chancellery of the of the Grossrosen camp, there was a special commander of prisoners in Ludwigovice and Ludwigsdorf, where 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 the hand is, which was under supervision of the Luftwaffe and not for the, of the SS, which uh, had uh, pretty exceptional conditions, exceptionally good, very very normal meals with milk, warm dinners. Uh, unlike in the concentration camp for the SS, but uh, supposedly it was some uh, special commander working on something very important, and obviously, as I, one can guess, they didn't survive. But they, sometimes uh, such uh, exceptions has, had happened that the c conditions were much better. There was also a special commander of children here, used for the for the experiments around 200 children, supposedly. I can mm. check it out, but there is a researcher specializing in the in such uh, things. Um, well, that would be a, of special interest because uh, the use of children or Men mentally handicapped children. Mm. Oh, mentally ha really? Uh, do you know were they uh, autistic? I don't know. Mm. Who did okay uh, because there is some new information coming mm. forward about autism and the link between autism uh -huh. and being precognitive, in other words, seeing the future. I mean, there is a. And there would there be is, some there, link there is with an, there, is, there is an assumption that they were used for the experiments because one of the persons uh, playing a crucial role here, which I I just forgot to say about him, 
was Professor Hubertus Struckholt, who was a pioneer of uh, space medicine, and he ran an underground facility nearby, which is, as I mentioned, the, the, there was an SS, special S3 undertaking, encompassing Riese, probably the Ludwikowice, Ludwigsdorf, and various other places, uh, facilities. And one of them was uh, the underground uh, space research facility run by uh, Professor Hubertus Struckholt. He said about it uh, in, in an interview for a Polish uh, journalist in the 1960s or something, I don't remember. And uh, he has said that he has tested some, uh, some kind of... Uh, he said that it was a simulator of a space flight, but actually it was controllable. Namely, that uh, uh, when the propulsion worked uh, very intensively or high energy uh, it was involved, something like that, uh, the, that thing, the cabin capsule system, whatever, I don't know, uh, was hard to control, for example, and uh, it was known that this command of children was uh, dedicated to his uh, research post. So it was assumed that uh, they were used, these children, for experiments. But it cannot be certain, perhaps, for other, for other reasons. He was a professor of medicine, but various things are possible, I just don't know. Hmm. Okay, but Kronos, to get back to the notion of the, the top uh, secret, the I, sort of... Uh -huh. um, I, I, I would just recommend checking, checking it out in the internet or some. Yes, but no, I, I'm saying that there is something to do with the idea of seeing into the future in, in Kronos. Um, in other words, I believe it's the father of... Mm -hmm. Of yeah, time or, I, I or of seeing I forward, I understand and there's that, a link between the um, the bell and anti gravity, and also um, you know, being able to move into the or see through the future. Because mm -hmm. there is a link with, uh, of course, you won't be familiar probably with the looking looking glass. What we know of as looking glass technology uh -huh. that Dan Biersch talks about. No, I but don't know. This is the uh, a technology in which you can see into the future. You know, uh, gravity is about time space, so there is no way to 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 disconnect uh, space from time and gravity from time in this respect. But I don't think that they would be interested in time. Uh, namely, it wasn't uh, you know useful in any say in any way to save. Uh, uh, the third try, not in, not in any obvious way, uh -huh. except for the chosen name, Kronos. One, no, I, one I, would I, make one would say that I, one, it I, I can't quite be yeah, made I, accidental. I, 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 yeah, I wouldn't worry about it because the code names, uh, uh, by definition, are misleading. Do you think That's so? A, <laughs> That's well, a basic rule. Well, an example of that is Project Paperclip. What does that mean? That's the purpose of it. Uh, well, so, they, they uh, may be uh, misleading on the surface, and yet there may be a deeper meaning in terms of uh, the occult. Uh, as I because mentioned, there is a, often an occult it, significance that is that does have have actual uh, between science uh -huh. and si sing it, it, symbols. It, it had to be related to time anyway, so it is possible. But I don't think that uh, uh, they would be interested in using time. Okay, but in terms of an anti gravity using anti-gravity as a propulsion system or as a method of of what you called um, getting, in other words, if you're getting, you know, distributing a weapon, a, weapon to, to a delivery system, yeah. it, it almost seems uh, that that it in itself wouldn't be an efficient means. Because be. if you have yeah. to, if you use anti-gravity to get something from one place to another, uh -huh. isn't it possible that you also, the thing itself, cannot be, um, it has to lose uh, material, it because, must dematerialize in a sense no. to get from one place no. to another. Isn't no. there a sense of that? No. Because various experiments on gravity were c conducted and uh, I didn't hear about such a, such a thing. No, sure. I would actually say that 
this would be pure cutting edge research that, that they were doing. They didn't know where this was going to lead, but they knew that this was something yeah. that was unknown and therefore potentially useful because that's the way they, the they looked at everything. The most striking, sorry, the most striking th thing for me is that they d had developed theory, as I mentioned, Professor Pasquale Jordan, in connection with Professor Gerlach had developed a theory describing this on the basis of quantum physics, which could be a breakthrough. No, almost nobody knows about it. He was supposed to be to receive a Nobel Prize after the war for that. But uh, after his connections, you know, links from the time of war were revealed partially, uh, somebody else has got the Nobel Prize. But uh, th that's that's strange thing. Because it, it cannot be debunked, it was uh, and it was itself a breakthrough. It was, um, you know, uh, and I don't have to add that mm. uh, uh, Einstein's approach wasn't that uh, obvious for them for for, for ideological re ideological reasons. That's one reason, and the other one, Germany was a motherland of quantum physics, mm. and they had no reasons to 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 believe a theory which is abstracted from, from everything else in the physical world. Mm. That's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it, it may be because I'm not a physicist, but mm -hmm. is, is there some way you can draw some kind of um, parallel into... I mean, because you're, you're acting as though everything needed to be very practical, and yet this in itself is a theory of matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, in a sense, the experiments that, if there was such a thing as the bell, and if there were experimenting with anti-gravity, in a sense, and it was a delivery system was the end result, then what would be the method of delivery using anti-gravity? Would it be a craft of some kind? A, a craft of some kind. Would it be uh, the, the, a craft the, that would, in yeah. other words, just let me finish the, this thought because um, thinking about this uh, mountain that you told me, um, asked me to take a look at in, in this uh, sort of um, rocket or whatever, and I'm wondering, it, would it be useful if the rocket were you know, to use anti-gravity in other words, to use a it, normal propellant to get it, up, it wouldn't but be, at some point... It wouldn't be a, a racket. Uh, this object has been, have, have been described as oblong or, uh, or uh, ball-shaped. And uh, uh, it would just fly everywhere. You know, one of the unresolved aspect of this physics, of this physics, based on these theories, is t such that in the documents uh, relating to Richter in the American paperclip files, it has been described very strange thing. I'm not sure if it will be familiar to you or not, but uh, a certain uh, it could stay behind this uh, decomposing or decaying structures. It's a long story. I will not uh, tell about it because it will be very long. But. Uh, uh, as it has been described in these documents, a certain exchange mechanism of energy has been detected, uh, discovered, and uh, the result of, of that was such that uh, apparently energy has uh, appeared out of nothing, which means that it could have been that such a, you know, such a vort vortices with that I, I, I just wanted to say that perhaps it didn't even need uh, any significant amount of power except for the setting it in motion. But such a vortex, it's, uh, it's also called as a ball-shaped ball type uh, vortex. Uh, the main feature of such a thing is that uh, it is isolated from the external... You know, no, I, say, I will say it differently. I was talking with... Uh, plasma physicist, and uh, about vortices in plasma. And he was saying that, uh, you know, generally, on, if you have a, a discharge, electric discharge in plasma, there are often some vortices are generated. But uh, 
they are visible only on ultra fast photographs because they live for microseconds or nanoseconds or something because it's a it's a gas generally it's, uh, which is under very high pressure very hot and it dissipates the energy and just didn't live very long but on the other hand you have ball lightning for example which lives for a minute or sometimes longer or sometimes longer and there is a different completely different mechanism it's not such a normal vortex as we can see normally mm. because because the fields are isolated then it's almost entirely a different world in itself such a bubble of closed you know time space in a way because it penetrates obstacles such as glass and yeah. metal and uh, goes right through it it doesn't need energy it needs energy to create it but once it uh, spins it don't it doesn't yes. almost when compared to you know when you compare to microsecond with a minute you have the order of millions yes yep so understood p- perhaps it wouldn't even need a, a source of energy significant source of energy yes <laughs> once it's created very interesting fascinating topic yeah fascinating so Igor, thank you so much. Not a problem. My pleasure. I have a request for you, actually, this evening, if possible. Mm -hmm. I know there's a beautiful new books, and I can't read a word of it, but I would love to look at some of the images. Oh, but it is also um, striking, this picture. There is one more interesting thing, maybe not for the camera. Okay. uh, You could turn it off. uh, Okay. There is a document about uh, Professor Struckel, the one that... uh, Struckel uh, yeah. was a pioneer of uh, space medicine. Mm. And, uh, oh, really? And he was taken over in paperclip. Uh, as I mentioned, what kind kind of experiments he carried out here? Uh, there is t- so it's from American archives, so in, it's, it's in English. The chief of the Department of Space Medicine, at Randolph Air, Air Base, Air Force Base, he said yesterday. In the field of space medicine, we are not behind anyone. The same things the Russians are doing with their dog, we are finding out with men. And that is interesting. <laughs> you yes, know, if, yes. if you place it in a different context, yes, it, this it's, is the it's, do- a, it's written yes. by Strukholt. Yeah, It's written by Strukholt. That's, okay. They may be talking about the dog Laika. They didn't need is it to. Is dog that they, went they, into they didn't space? Yes. Any dog. yes, the name is Laika. We're not behind anyone. Yeah. The Philadelphia experiment took place in what year? I don't know. I I, I know almost nothing about the Philadelphia experiment. I think well, that, that it's was, just that it happened that was, after the war, though. No, no it's before the war. Well, that's I will 42. show you one more thing. Yeah. Okay. That was 41 or 42, I think. There is Vikovice. Yeah. Here. I'd be interested to... I don't know whether... This... Are sh- there Russians hmm. living in, in this part of Poland? No. Not at all. Okay. Okay. So I'm looking uh, now. I've got an image of the the map. Excuse okay, me. Go I, ahead. May I say something? Yep. There is the valley where the hinge is. The hinge is the the that circular place uh, structure, and uh, all these roads here are, made, are lined up with concrete, and they lead to other uh, to other objects in the in the in the, in the entire area. It, the entire valley was turned into, transformed into a uh, closed area 51 like uh, place. Yep, I've, that's a, I've got a good a good image of that. That's the mountain massive, and uh, that's for example one of the underground facilities. When you you can see the pattern here, that's the. Uh, the, 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 these are sidings of the narrow gauge railway, so you can, you have some idea about the about the infrastructure. It was pretty extensive. The railway you're talking about a railway is that a railway on top of the ground or underneath? On top, entering the underground facilities. Then I see. Was it used originally by the mine? No, it's there was no mine. It's it's the Riza. The mine was on the other oh. side of the of the map. Sorry, I'm uh, hands uh, shaking. 
Okay. Is that a special map about wartime activity? Is that what it is? Uh, yeah. yeah. I saw the swastika on it, yes. Um, Bill? Yeah. So maybe you, for example... These documents, yeah, that's... It that's be good. You, you may, you know, uh, process it later. Yes. And this was, yes. It's a... Zanderbau for Heaven S3. It's a, it says that the, there was a larger undertaking than the reason and that uh, it was the largest such a project of the SS at all. And the document... Which is, part of is, it? ...is signed by Kamler. Does it say Kamler? Yeah, it doesn't say, but it doesn't it, it's just his signature. Okay. This is important stuff, where it says that it's the most... Um, just a moment, it's okay. A, just that little phrase. The document says that the... Reichsleader says, which means Himmler, has ordered certain things to do, but Kamler responds that it's, it is not possible because uh, the office C4, be, because this office is completely engaged uh, with the Zanderbau for Heaven SJ and therefore cannot execute such tasks. Uh -huh. Is is uh, absorbed with all its forces, with Alan Crefton, with this project, and therefore cannot ex execute anything else. Okay. With all its forces, you know, when Kamler responds that all yes. his forces of, of, of mm. his office yes. are engaged in something. Yeah, it means he's doing something that's top priority. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Fascinating. And at the same time. Uh, something unknown, completely. Previously. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I have. Uh, it's not says that uh, it's reason, but just a moment. I have uh, such a page from. Uh, it's a. It's a book. It's uh, called list of code names of, of German under, underground undertakings. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Which says that mm. the S three, S three, encompassed. The Hitler's headquarters in the East Prussia, uh, Riese, Basel, Lothenburg was the abode of the, of the Riese, Riediger, which is a communication center for the Riese, and for the entire, for the entire area here, and uh, Fürstenstein, which was the Hitler's headquarters, also within the S3, it's uh, some 15 kilometers from here. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. So, thank you very much, Igor, for this fascinating testimony. I know that this is a research in progress. It continues. And uh, I would really like to keep in touch with you to, to learn what you continue to learn as you're following this very interesting trail. Thank you. Thank you, too. It's my pleasure.